All righty. Well, good morning. Um, hello, everyone. It's nine o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, today, we are here for the April 2023 release recaps, and um, I'm Amanda. I'm going to go ahead and start with the USAS part. Uh, just a minute here. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly recap like where I'm at um, in the wiki on this page. Uh, just so that if you want to follow along and you're not already there, uh, you can find it. So um, I just, from the main page, we're scrolling all the way down to this SSDT meetings and trainings. We we'll click that. And then um, again, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. I'm pretty zoomed in here to make sure we can see it. So uh, calendar year 2023. And then I'm going to April. Okay. So um, for USAS, uh, there were two releases within the month of April, and um, that was 8.70 and 8.71. They were both regular releases, so no hotfixes this month. Um, and then uh, mostly we have improvements on our list in one patch. So uh, for the improvements, the first thing on here, um, not something that you're going to see uh, a specific change in the software right now, but uh, some exciting news, I think, for all of us um, for uh, the future here. And um, the first one was updates to be able um, to have an anonymized option. So the improvements um, completed changes we need to make to facilitate anonymizing a backup of district data um, so that we could create testing, training, or demo instances. And then there's a note here that says, however, we're still working on the um, MCO, MCO, ECN, DCO team. I'm sorry, so working with <laughs> uh, to make a VRA option available. As soon as that's available, we will let you know. Um, I'm sure it will be like an email notification or something of the sort. Um, so this update removed the classic import log again, just when anonymize, just in order to anonymize an instance. And um, we also wrote an anonymizer for projects. So, um, and again, like official email will come out at that point. So, you know, wait for that as far as um, some of the more specific information on how that'll work. But from my understanding, the general idea is that, um, you know, you could pull an actual district data, but if you wanna use that for something like, like um, training um, or testing, you can anonymize it so that it's not actually their data. There's not identifying information in there. Um, it would just be like a miscellaneous um, example, of, you know, district database at that point. So, um, so again, yeah, exciting things. So we're putting some pieces in place to make that happen in the future. Okay. Yeah, Carol, me too. <laughs> me too. Because when, when that's ready, we'll get to use it too. I'm really excited about it. Um, all right. The next one is um, we changed the timestamp and here's a little format. I won't read that out to you because <laughs> it doesn't make much sense um, with all the letters there. But the main the main difference you'll see here is is this last part. So essentially, this adds AM PM to the timestamps. Um, there's a note on this JIRA issue that says that it may impact like if there were multiple places that were in this old format. Um, however, primarily the reason they changed this, the place that we're seeing this most often, you know, most um, prominently is the job scheduler. So now you'll notice um, in the job scheduler, it does have an AM PM on it. And um, a lot of other places in the software, like our format, like sometimes on, you know, certain reports or that sort of thing, like, you know, usually there's a way to tell whether that's like in, a different time configuration where it's like military time or something. And you know what, I again, I don't have specific examples of, um, you know, how they're formatted in each spot in the software. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I do know that at least in this spot, um, you know, in the job scheduler, it was, it was, uh, you know, it didn't have the AM PM. And so sometimes that got confusing. So that's what this is solving is um, just having that so that it's, uh, it's, it's got that designation on there. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. I'm like, I realize <laughs> going off on a tangent here, I haven't had nearly enough coffee <laughs> to point out uh, the different timestamps uh, in all the different places. So 
<laughs> um, okay, next uh, we um, removed this obsolete SSDT auditor report bundle with this release. Um, we talked about this one last time. So uh, I think I have an example actually in the previous month's um, release recap. And basically we added the audit jobs. It's been some time since we added those that was around fiscal year end. So there was still a report bundle sitting out there that used to be used before those were added. Um, but now the audit jobs should be used. Like that's what AOS, um, you know, per their direction. Um, so we went and just took out this auditor bundle to prevent any confusion. Um, and it was kind of obsolete as far as what was included in there. So um, that that's no longer in the um, in the standard bundles in any instance. It'll just be gone. Um, but that's why. Okay, okay, and here's our big one. So this one is um, importing vendor adjustments via the vendor grid import option. Um, so previously you could only post the vendor adjustments, um, for like by entering them to the individual vendor. And, uh, this one, I'm going to go hop into the instance. Let's take a look at where we're talking about these. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm core menu vendors. You know what? Hang on. Let me zoom this in a little bit. There we go. Okay, core menu, vendors. And um, I just have this first one here is just um, kind of an example vendor. Um, well, actually, you know what? I have some, eh, yeah, let's look at this one because I do, I have some already in there, but we'll enter a test one so we can see. So um, right at the top here, we have the vendor adjustments. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And we can see that we have these different adjustments in here. So the new option for the import that we're talking about is specifically about adding another one of these. So previously, you'd have to come in here, click create, enter a date, description. And then it's an amount. So you would click whether it's taxable or not. And you could post this. It's going to add it here, um, and what this is actually impacting is, let me just pull this down here to be like under this line, is what that's actually impacting is this, these totals under the amounts line. So the fiscal to date taxable, fiscal to date total, year to date total, and um, year to date taxable total. Okay, so what's interesting about this is like there are really just certain situations where you would use this. Like this isn't going to be um something that's super commonly used but it will be helpful in the times that you need it so um essentially like these totals that you're seeing here um on the amounts that's what you know is actually um paid to the vendor throughout the year the fiscal year um those come from disbursements um from checks that are paid to that vendor and those are calculated and included in those amounts now, at the end of the year, when those are reviewed, there are some situations. Void checks from prior year is a good example. Um, you know, or even if maybe something was like charged on it in, on like that vendor got split and had like one payment to like a new vendor number and you want to um, correct that. Those are reasons for manual adjustments. Um, and then a big one is like, if there is a case where somebody is gonna be like, new to the software um, and they're adding all of their vendors at fiscal year, then um, you would need to have an adjustment for any checks that aren't like actually in the software um, for the calendar year. So, so that's why this option might be used. Um, but let's look at like how it actually works. So um, this is the import option here. And when we click this, this, this import option was already here before, um, but it was just for adding or updating vendors. And that is still available. So that is if you actually want to add the vendor information, I want a new vendor number, here's their name, here's their address. That's this first option here that, that we're already clicked on. 
And then if you do the add the vendor adjustments, then um, that option is going to be to add those um, amount adjustments that we were looking at. So you select this, choose your file, and then load it in. And it would go ahead and add entries on that little mini grid that we were looking at. Um, so using the new import option, um, yeah, the ability to mass post the vendor adjustments is available, but here's what we want. The criteria and template available, um, sorry, template is available on the vendor wiki page. And um, I just want to look at that real quick too. So this takes you a direct link to the section that has that information. Um, here are the fields. Here are the required fields are marked. Um, to tell you what you need to have included in here. And then I do have a template spreadsheet linked here, which I already downloaded. So you can see it's very simple, but um, that gives you, you know, an easy format if they wanted to fill this in and be able to upload some of those vendor adjustments. Okay. Um, let's see. There is, um, I wasn't sure if I had a note in here about this, but um, I believe, okay, so I'll double check and I, I might add a note to this after the fact if you're reviewing this later um, regards to this um, to clarify, but I believe too, all right, so each import, when you look at this import window, we have the add or update the vendors, add the vendor adjustments. So, um, if you're using the first option, it's only going to look at fields that are relevant to adding or updating a vendor. If you use this add vendor adjustments, it's only going to look at the fields for vendor adjustments. But technically, you could have those things in the same spreadsheet. Like if you were updating a vendor and then um, adding a vendor adjustment. Um, so it won't, I believe, um, and again, I'll double check this, I believe it won't necessarily error if you were to use a spreadsheet that had columns that applied to both, um, it won't, but it won't recognize them. Like you'd still have to use the import method for what you're trying to add. I don't know how common that'll be since I think the vendor adjustments, like you might, you'd have, you know, maybe multiple of those, um, it wouldn't necessarily be just when adding a vendor, but totally depends on the situation. So I just want to mention that too, because, um, you know, in situations where like maybe there is a reason to be like adding vendors and then also trying to attach them out with them, that may save some work. So um, yes, I'll double check that and then add a note on here um, if that is um, to confirm. And that's the one where I was a really, um, you know, a, a couple different steps in there, but I'm also very, very excited about this change as well. Um, so this last one, well, we have a patch, um, and I guess let's let's just look at this real quick. Is we did have one patch for a district um, that had a count change that was in progress. Uh, the application restarted. This was only for that one specific district, and um, you know, we've been in contact with them to. Uh, to let them know that that went out. So uh, this last one here then is we um, added the fields to the canned version of the financial detail report um, to basically replicate the data that was generated by template reports when selecting CSV or Excel data. This one's really interesting to me because, okay, so essentially if we come back, let's come over here. Let's go, um, first, I just want to like quickly look at uh, we're talking about the canned report for this update, but I want to look at the um, template report for just a second to kind of talk this through with you, is we had our financial detail report, and along the way, we added this option with the SOAR options. We talked about this in some of our trainings, and we had the, these dynamic SOAR options that we gave so that you would be able to come over here and add um, these fields to be able to like sort and filter by them. So you could add a control break without having to make a new uh, report. And that was really awesome. Um, so what we did is we added these as suppressed fields in the report definition. 
And so when you run these reports to PDF, you don't see any of these fields unless you choose to sort on them, which is great. That was a way around, you know, what we did at that point. Um, However, one result of that is that when you run the template version to of Excel, it was adding those fields on as columns, which, you know, was it wasn't like a problem. Also, you could delete them if you didn't need them. Like, it was just a result of, you know, we were making this available for the sort um, in this aspect, and then um, that kind of happened too. So then we rewrote this report for performance to the canned report right so especially the financial detail that one gets like extremely better performance um in this canned version well we had more flexibility as far as what we could control um when we generated this canned version so we had the options over here we have them so you could use them for um adding those to the report as like a control break or a sort. Um, but because we had more control, we didn't know that anybody was using those on the Excel report for anything. So we didn't include them on the Excel report. Um, but what's very interesting to me is that we had a lot of tickets more recently where we found districts were actually, instead of using the fast version, the canned version, they were using the template report because that was being requested by them. Um, and I, I think by like third parties, I, I can't speak officially, obviously, like I can only tell you, you know, what, what I'm seeing as far as the request, maybe, you know, <laughs> um, but it seemed that, you know, people were, uh, districts were then using that template version to actually get those fields on the Excel output. So because we heard that um, multiple times because of how people were kind of still like, trying to use custom reports or um, template reports, um, it seemed that it would be very valuable to go ahead and just add these fields just to the Excel version to help them with this sorting and filtering after they get into a spreadsheet. So uh, we did. So if I go ahead, I'm again, I'm on the canned financial detail and I'm gonna run this for the whole year. Um, I'm going to run this for Excel data, and I'm just going to run it for my general fund. Excuse me. And when I open this up, just loading this my vendor adjustment. Here we go. Okay. Let me sort out this Excel formatting real quick. Let's zoom in this way. Okay, I'm just zooming a little bit and let's scroll over here. So what we added is these columns. So, and again, like if they don't need these, like just like with the Tumblr report, if they don't need these, they can easily just go ahead and delete those columns. Um, but if they do need these now they have them so it has some really helpful stuff in here uh, these first ones are receipt transactions so like this is just the first two digits of the object level um, the entire account code is broken out and um, it also has this forecast line number on it which I believe that's what we got requests for uh, quite a bit was the forecast line number so um, instead of just having I believe before it was just this uh, account code now it's got, you know, all these additional um, different fields that they can use for, you know, subtotaling after the fact or um, filtering down their spreadsheet. So I hope that's very helpful for them um, uh, based on, you know, the discussions that I've had on the tickets um, that have requested things like this. You know, it is difficult because um, we created these canned versions be for, for performance improvements. I'm sorry, for performance improvements. So uh, it's difficult when there's like a situation where someone's like, well, we have to use this template version. We have to use this because, you know, that is always going to be a slower version. And so if there are things that we can do to help so that make sure that these canned reports are functional and have, you know, the things that they need, obviously within like something that will benefit, you know, the masses, um, as well, we want to do that though, because we want to make sure that these um, they can get these performance benefits whenever possible. So um, 
the other thing that I noticed is when this was being requested, it was like generally also for a fiscal year, which, you know, that in the template version will take a long time, whereas in the canned version takes seconds or minutes, you know, depending on really like how big, um, how many transactions they have rather. So, so anyways, I think that's a really good benefit. And I will say, um, this is not the only report that's getting this update. Uh, it's not in here with the April updates, but the first, uh, the first update of, uh, May, just give me a little preview, <laughs> is, uh, something, the similar idea is going to be happening here with the account activity report. So we'll talk about that next month. Um, but yes, so, uh, I, so I think that's excellent. Um, and let's switch back over here. I have an example on here. Um. And then we did list out like all of those different um, columns that were added in the documentation as well. Okay. Oh yeah. Um. I I don't think I said it, but um. Also indirect costs. That was that was one that where it came up for us is uh, um. We had requests related to um, indirect costs because they were trying to um, filter by like a specific aspect, and that was one where. Um, we were getting reports that people were trying to pull with those extra columns. So, um, so that's a good example of where um, this update may be uh, helpful to generating their reports. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that is all I have for you, SAS. We are on to USPS next. Thank you, Mina. You're welcome. Window I need. Okay. You can see my screen. Okay. We'll go ahead with the payroll side of the releases. And we have um what's the top here? We have three to go over. We had two releases and then one hot fix to go over. And we'll start with the bug fixes. Boy. Um, the first one was um, a, the new contract. Um, a warning was updated um, when they were running it to include pay groups um, to pull people in. And when they were putting them over to the maintenance, when they were um, into the screen for maintenance, they were finding that the ending date was getting populated with the wrong date because what it was doing, it was using the original payroll stop dates of it when it should have been using a pay group. So when the districts use the additions for pay groups during payroll, it was still looking at that original payroll stop date and not the pay date, pay group last pay date in the ending date in the new contract. And that was throwing off their calculations um, for these type of employees that are pulled in only during additions during payroll. Um, so it was using that original um, initialization of the payroll instead of using and looking at the pay group um, additions ending date that usually the start and stop dates are different, might have the same pay date, but not the last um, ending date. So that was corrected. And the next one was under um, reports and EMIS physician report. Um, districts were finding out that um, the report was excluding archive positions, which is correct, but behind the scenes, um, when it was sending it to the data collector, it was not. So it was pulling in those archive positions on the data collector side of things when we were sending them there, and it shouldn't have been. So now when um, now when they run the report, they're not they don't show archive, and those archive won't get sent over to um, the data collector too. So now those two match. The next one was uh, to correct a bug in the job scheduler um, for email um, direct deposit notices when they were scheduled. Um, we found a district that had scheduled direct deposit job, then they unposted the payroll and then um, reinitialized the payroll. But for um, some reason that job um, would just failed, it should have failed, but what it was doing was showing an error out there and wouldn't let them continue. It should have just, um, 
failed the uh, job scheduler and direct deposit notices, and then they should have just been able to go out and reschedule it for the um, another day or reschedule it for that time again. Um, so that was corrected for that um, district. Uh, the next one was the earnings register. Um, the selection by pay group was not working correctly. Um, what it seemed to be doing was when they're running earn earnings register for like a selected pay group, it was pulling in all the employees that were paid, regardless if they were in that pay group or not. So now that has been fixed. So now when they run an earnings register, select a pay group, it's only pulling in those employees that have been paid within those dates that they entered for that pay group. So that has been corrected for that bug. The next one is the payroll items error adjustments. Um, they were, some districts were seeing errors when they were going in, added a payroll item, then they had to go back and edit and add an error adjustment for that employee right away. Districts receiving this pop-up error message, they were able to save it, but, and it, and it saved fine, but they always got this error message popped up and not all districts probably did. Um, and that was some kind of a bug behind the scenes. Um, so the, um, the developers were able to find out what that was causing that and they fixed it on the, on the release. So now they should not have any more of those uh, pop-up error messages um, when they're trying to save a payroll error adjustment. The next one is the leave activity report. Um, they were having, um, we we're finding that we had two districts come back um, the stating when they were trying to run the report for a certain date, it was running, it was throwing a null pointer error and access denied. Um, they were able to figure, find that out what was causing that and they um, were able to fix that for those two districts. And now nobody should be run into that issue anymore. The next one is the improvements, um, the timestamp format on the job scheduler and posting period. Um, same thing, um, I believe Amanda has shown you, um, but for the payroll side, it actually added the AM PM now. So now you have your AM, so you know when they were created or if it was a PM. And then also that goes to the job scheduler. And this has been updated also. So now you see the AM and the, or the PM. The next improvement we did, um, so this would be for um, SRS Advance coming up, um, which is going to be very helpful, I think, for districts and ITCs, because what was happening, we were having a lot of issues where districts were just um, not finishing their STRS Advance and then um, flying on to their next payroll in July, and that was causing a lot of issues. And so what we came up with is this in SRS Advance under config. And this is automatically marked for everyone. Where's your web? That's three seconds. There we are. Right here. So if you have a district that does not process STRS advance, this is what they'll need to go in and on check. So once this is on check, now districts can um, not finish STRS advance and go on to the first pay in July. But this would be strictly only for districts of your districts that don't process STRS advance. Otherwise, you will want them to leave that checked um, and they should be able to get into the STRS advance and uncheck it themselves. Um, so that way they can't bypass it and run their payroll because again, um, there was a lot of issues last year when they were bypassing and just running the payroll and then things weren't flagged as STRS advance. So hopefully this will stop um, some of the headaches that were caused last year with that. Um, so again, um, make sure that this is checked. And then for your, your districts, I think maybe maybe there is one that I recall that from ITC that um, don't run STRS advance um, that they can uncheck this. So then that won't stop them from going on and running their first payroll so they can bypass that. So that is out there now. Okay. So the next one is the employee entity. Um, 
all this is, this was uh, behind the scenes. It went from a custom field into a property. Um, so now the, it's in the same location. It's just, it's, um, it just, the, the software looks at it differently than what it was. Um, so now it's just a check distribution. And then if you go to mass load, that kind of, that field kind of changed too from a custom field. There we go, employee. And it used to be, it used to read custom field check distribution, just like these were, but no longer, it is no longer a custom field. It's a, it's just check distribution. So when they're, if they're using mass load, um, they just want to make sure that they um, change that to check distribution now and take out the custom fields because that's no longer um, worded like that anymore. And that is a behind the scenes thing in the property. So just wanted to let you know on that one. Um, the salary notice, um, we did add a couple of new fields this time. And we got more, um, there's a lot more that to be added, but that will be coming um, in the future. And I'll go ahead and go to payroll and contract. And all those fields are listed here under salary notices. And they're all listed here. So all these are all the ones that we have up to date now that are available for salary notices on those merge field names. And then the ones that were added this time around were the pay per period, the pay plan, and hours and day. And then these are the exact um, merge fields that you can copy and paste when you're doing that merge. And um, again, like I said, Michelle and Lori did a really nice video that you can use that's located out on our um, training page um, that shows how to actually set up um, a custom salary notice. Okay. All right. And the next one we're going to go to is um, add sort options to the benefit cruel and reset personal leaves reports. So now we have some different sort options that were added. Mm, which one's right again? Oh. Reset. Okay. Benefit accrual. So now you have your sort options. Why can't I find that? There we go. So we have our sort by now. So we have your employee name number, but also pay group, department and building and appointment type. So and those are under the benefit accrual and the reset personal leave um, reports. So the pay group, building department and certified and classified has been added. And there's the ones under the accrual you can see have been added. Okay. The next thing, um, we had um, some requests from districts that wanted the case number and the order number to actually print on the outstanding payables report when they're running that. So now those two columns have been added. So if the, if the report finds a um, child support payroll item, and those order and case numbers are filled in on the payroll item itself, payroll item configuration. Yeah, I think it's actually payroll item. So now it knows to look at that. And I don't have one. I don't believe I have one set up for child support. I do. There we go. So now um, that report will look at these case numbers, the set case number and the order number. So 
So they just want to make sure um, if those are not filled in, they can fill those in. And now they will pull on the outstanding payables report. So they can include that with the check if they like. Okay. The next one is the building and department codes. Um, this was something that was improvement added. And now they can find this under core. And it's called codes. So now they can just go here and create all their new ones, or I guess update if they have to. Um, they're all listed under one, one grid now. So I think that's going to be um, saving uh, districts some time. Um, what these um, improvements, these uh, will include like the attendance import, benefit and update projection, the ABS reports, it affects the perfect attendance and employee master reports, the lead balance, the quarter report, reporting identity count summary report, the year to date report, W-2 report and payroll reports. So this update um, affected all these different areas. So this was something that was done um, behind the scenes and renaming the old building department codes, custom fields, and they made them um, unusable. So what we had found also from one ITC, uh, a district, they had positions. So you might wanna let your districts know if you use position templates for your districts, um, let's see if I can do this right here. If you have a list of templates that you choose for each, like different employees that you have, you could have multiple. If you go in and look under your districts, you're gonna see that these building and department codes got erased. It was a code when they did the um, update, um, it didn't get caught. So I would have all your districts look, the ones that use just the templates. Now, if they don't use templates, they're fine. The code's updated. But if all those, if you have multiple templates listed under position, then I'm going to have to go to each of those positions, templates, and re-add the codes for those templates. Um, this was just noticed a, a day or two ago. So I added it in there that makes sure you contact your districts that you know that use those templates and they need to go in there and re-add those codes back in just for those templates. Because right now they were erased. So once they re-add re -add them back in, you're fine. It won't, it, it, they're there then. So just wanna make sure you mention that to your districts, okay? And then, um, also, a new role was added. Um, you have your standard read-only users. Um, uh, the standard code view and report was added to them for the standard user. Now it, um, it's under the USP standard. The group manager has this. And then if any other roles that um, of you want your employees at the district to have, um, they have the option to use the USB standard code and they can add the create, delete, report, update, and view permissions separately if they like. But those, that is what the new role is. Okay. Um, okay. Another thing I wanted to mention under that code, um, you can add up to 10. So if I try to add more than 10, it's going to give you an error. You can only go up to, uh, 10 and under. Um, you can add, it can be numeric, um, alphanumeric, numeric. You can add hyphens in. So, um, so that they can just remember that, that they can add um, different all alpha if they like in their building and um, in the codes for the department. Um, they can't delete any that if those codes are attached to a position, they can't delete them. So just to let them know on that. All right, I think I hit everything on the new building codes. 
Okay. Um, the new features. Um, we went over the new code um, on that one. So um, that one, I just kind of, because that was up here too, because they had moved all the codes over to this new um, core one. So that kind of was went hand in hand together. And then the new other new uh, feature that we have is the leave activity report. And that can be find, found under reports and leave activity. Okay. And then um, as you can see here, we have, can be sort by a number and name. You can do begin each employee on a new page. You have your beginning and end dates. You can include sick leave, personally vacation. You can include ineligible employees. You can include archive employees. Or you can run the report by one employee or multiple or all if you leave it empty. So one thing I want to mention, so districts know this, is I'm going to go to our documentation here because I think this can be a little confusing because this report is running off a date applied and not, and not the actual activity date they entered. So they're gonna have to remember that. And we do have a helpful hint down here to remember it's the applied date that they actually added because a lot of districts uh, might add a date for, um, but they're in the future and they added them all today, but they added them for five days in advance. When they try to run that report, it's not going to include them because if, it just depends when they, I should say, they sh it depends when they're actually running that report. So I added a few attendants here for one of my employees. And the beginning, oh, excuse me, the um, Brent Hurst here. I added activity date of 427 and then I did a future one. So I did a past and new future and I did those today. So when I ran the activity report, say from 4-1 to 4-30, it, it didn't show them. Because you have to remember it's going off the date applied, not the actual activity date. So you're thinking, okay, the 427 should be included in there. It's not gonna, going to be included in there. You have to remember that it's going off the date applied. And what can be very helpful for districts, I think, is if, if they're having troubles pulling them in, they can't figure out why, have them run an auto report for attendance and, and check when did they, when did they actually um, enter those dates in, my time timestamp date. So now when I run that leave activity report for 5-1 to 5-5, that's what they showed up. They're here. So I think maybe mentioned to them run the audit report. And I think that will help them see when that timestamp was, um, when they actually added them in, the date they added them in, not the actual activity date that they used. Okay. Um, I also ran an audit report for the same employee using 512 to 530. And it won't list them, but it does give me my same ending balance as it would have included. It just doesn't show them. So I think it's gonna be a learning curve for some districts on how this report is actually pulling them in. Does anybody have any questions on the leave activity report? Um, again, we try to make it um, under um, helpful hints to let them know. And this was due to the fact of non-deferred districts. Um, this is why this report had to be set up in the way it is. Okay. Um, again, we end it. We added um, some helpful hints and like under the end date, so they can see actually how that report is being used and what it's pulling in at that time. So I think it would be very helpful for districts to use as long as they understand how that report is trying to pull in those dates. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. 
I think that's all I have. Um, the only other thing I, oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Um, let's see, why was date applied use instead of activity date? Your just usually want to see what is used in the fiscal year, not when they enter the dates. And again, that is due to the non-deferred in leave and the um, districts. Um, this was due to, because they had to, from what I understanding, they had to use the activity of the of the date they added the the time the like the timestamp date applied, and the employee's balance is updated today, and then it's reflected on the report. Um, and that's why I'm saying it's going to be a learning curve for a lot of districts because, again, the districts that are non deferred. If they enter a sick day today with activity date of next week, um, it automatically updates the balance right away. Now, deferred um, districts probably won't see an issue, but it's the ones that are non-deferred. Um, they it, it reflects on the report if they run it today. So I know it's hard to explain. <laughs> um, Yeah, so they have to make sure that they just learn that they have to, like I said, if they have issues, make sure they use the audit report for the timestamp. Um, we, I know we had questions on this and tickets before why they're not using activity date, but from the developer side of it, they had to do this for, like I said, non-deferred districts, and it has to update the balance in the activity um, when they run the report, so it gets included. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, is there any other questions on the leave activity report? Can I ask a follow up on that? Sure. Yeah, so basically, it's non deferred districts, but it's non deferred districts that are posting in the future. Most of our districts, like like let's say uh, you know the payroll is up through today you know, and um, so they would be posting leave up through today and, and maybe they do it Tuesday. So they would just have a couple of days into the future, potentially, like if somebody, they imported it on the second and they pulled leave through the fifth, they'd have a couple of days in the future, maybe is what you're saying. That's what you're talking, like, uh, we don't have any district that like imports all of the leave from a kiosk or frontline or whatever like all the way through like May 31st, right? Like let's say the payroll end date is the 5th. They're not grabbing anything to the 31st, everything to the 31st, unless they do have the deferred check. It's kind of like, are, are there districts who are basically grabbing all leave all time and not using deferred? Is that like what the worry on the report is? I guess, I guess they're just wanting to make sure that all the activity date is being included. Okay. I mean, I can see how you would miss a couple of days, right? Like I said, like we have some people that like, if the pay date was the fifth, their final pay would be the 20 or their final date of the pay period would be the 28th. And then those people would never have that happen, right? Because they'd be like, right. let's say they imported on the second. Obviously, there would be no future leave if they have right. that lag built in. But we obviously right. have districts that don't have lag built in, just like everybody does. Right. Um, it's, so they could miss those. That's kind of like, right. if that makes sense. Right. So they just have to remember when, when, like I said, when they're entering them and when they're running the reports. Because like I said, I entered these today for 512 and I just did one for fire just so I could show you when I ran it from 5-1 to 5-5. Five five it pulled it in, even though I, I said I just wanted days from 5-1 to 5-5. Five five. It still pulled in that 427 because I added it today because it was a prior date. Okay. So kind of like assuming, assuming that they're using kiosk, that date applied should be the same day that they pulled it out of kiosk. Well, as long as they put it in the same day. I mean, that's I mean, the problem it. because if you're pulling it all out of kiosk like today and you have activity dates that are for two weeks period, you're going to so see- date date applied should all be today it will be all day today because it was applied all yeah. in one spreadsheet okay 
Well, no, that's yeah. what I'm kind of trying to get yeah. at. I can say, hey, guys, this is what this means. Think about yes. data applied as the day you pulled yes. out a kiosk and put it yes. in here. If there I go. say it right. that way, and I feel like for the rest of us on the call, if we say it that way, like, hey, this is yeah. the day you pulled out a kiosk, because you can go see that in kiosk, too. It tells you when you export it. So, exported it out. Yeah, yeah you, you can see so that, that date. So that's a good idea. They can use that in kiosk for those sisters that use that. But I just, I guess I didn't think about that part of the kiosk that they could actually see that. Um, so that's why I kind of mentioned the audit yeah. report too. It, it could be a never like helpful way. Audit report, but some of them, I'm sure you know this, some of them like they think this thing is great and some of them look at it and there's too many some words on it. <laughs> and that's why I said, I think it's going to take some time for it to sink in how the report is working. So that's why I thought, you know, I tried to give you different examples, like my dates, you know, yeah. you know, I, yeah. you know, I hear I ran a port and then my 427, obviously I had a 427 one here, but when I ran it from 41 to 430, it didn't show up. So districts are probably thinking, why isn't that activity date showing up? Yeah. Because it wasn't entered till May. So I and really Andrea. I think yes. you're going to have more of that than the future dates being entered Probably. in. And yes. if someone right. is wanting to look at what was done on a fiscal year and they run it from July 1 to June 30, but the last two weeks of June weren't entered in until the first two weeks of July of the right. next year or the previous year, the numbers are not going to be correct. correct. So correct. that's why it does not make sense that it's done on applied date rather than activity date. I, I I cannot see, even for deferred, I cannot see any logical reason why it would have to be applied date and not activity date. Correct. And again, this was, if I, I'm saying, I think and probably if you guys are going to have questions on this, this would be something made for the priority committee maybe to be brought up um, if you have concerns with this. Um, that would probably be my next, maybe your next step. If, because I, I definitely can see where this is going to cause problems because we already had tickets with this. And I think that's probably where, because we had talked about this with the developers. And again, like I said, they had to do it by the date applied and not the activity. So. And that's kind of why I said, you know, make the auto report. And like Andrew said, use the um, kiosks, you know, if they're running reports and not seeing what they think, um, again, have them go right back to that date applied because that's how the report is running off of right now. And it probably will, because from what I understood, it was because of these dates that are being entered, it, it, they have to go off the date applied. Thank you for explaining that. I really appreciate it. I, I'm hoping I, I explained it, it because no, yeah, it's confusing. I, <laughs> I think our most of our districts are kiosks. So I think if I go that route, every everybody will get it. But I can see okay. how. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. So so just to remember, and again, I, I we try to put it in here. So the helpful hints of so they understand that that's it's going off of not the activity, the date applied. So again, we have it in here. So hopefully. It brings, you know, draws their attention so they know that, yeah, it's not running on how they're thinking in their head with activity. So any more questions on this? Because I completely understand that it, it is confusing. Okay. And one other thing I did want to mention, we did have a hot fix that came out because we did have some issues with that new codes. So I just kind of wanted to, and, and it's fixed now. Um, I think that came out on May 1st, and that was the um, hot fix for the code. Um, we were having some issues um, with that. So now um, what was happening, districts or had duplicate codes in this uh, patch was failing, I think, or they were giving an error. So now if they, it was just failing. So now I think the patch was um, that if they do find duplicate codes, now it goes into the error log and they can actually see what was causing the problem. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that um, that was done right after, um, which was May, because I know we're not doing May release, but I did want to bring that to your attention that we did have that um, issue with our code when we were doing the code on the 6.9.
and that should be fixed. And if they did, hopefully did their up um, release for the 6.9.1, 6 then that will fix that um, issue that they're seeing. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions on April releases? Okay. I think I hit everything that needs to, and I will pass it on to Michelle for the inventory releases. I must be uh, logged in differently. Could you enable that so I can share your screen? Can you get it to share, Michelle? I can't get it to share. Can you go down? Yep. And I think it's host only. Let me change it. Awesome. It's working now. Yep. Thank you. There we go. Yep. Okay. I know for some reason it logged me in differently. So I apologize for that. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? So if so, awesome. Um, let me know if you can't. And I'm just going to move a couple things here. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the recap here. And um, we had uh, two releases and a hot fix for inventory. Um, the 134 was done on April 3rd, and then we had the 1.35 done um, on the 27th of April, and then we had a hot fix right after that. Um, so I want to go through um, what all happened here. Um, first off, um, I'm going to go to my grid here. Um, in the uh, transaction menus, um, we were had an issue where the edit and delete buttons were um, enabled, meaning they looked like they were enabled. Um, these two buttons right here um, for read only users. Um, so um, we fixed that so that they no longer show that they can edit or delete. They really couldn't. I mean, if they tried to go in and click on them, it wouldn't do anything, but we just wanted to make sure that those are showing basically um, uh, grayed out so that um, they couldn't access those. So we got that fixed. Um, under the system configuration, the migration import, uh, we corrected a problem with the migration importer. It was um, prevented fund function and asset classes from properly being set when. Um, ITCs were um, importing item information with multiple acquisitions. So this is for, this was kind of our rare situation where districts were starting up new. They weren't migrating from inventory. So they're start from EIS classic. They were starting new on inventory. And we were trying to import spreadsheets uh, for multiple acquisition items. And so it just wasn't setting that asset fund function and asset class um, fields properly. Um, so we got that updated as well. And I got a uh, thumbs up for one of the HCs that it worked correctly, and they were able to get through the rest of that. So that's been fixed. Um, also, we corrected a problem when posting error adjustments um, <clears throat> on either an acquisition or a transfer. So just to show you what I'm talking about here, if I go into acquisitions, and I'm just going to view the first one here. Um, that air correction um, flag there. Um, what was happening is that when they were creating like new acquisitions or transfers and set that air correction, um, you know, it's supposed to then update the adjustments column. Um, it, you know, if it was a capitalized assets to reflect properly on the gap report. In particular, it was the schedule of change in fixed assets summary and detail reports. Well, what was happening is it was updating that, but it was also affecting the beginning balance and it shouldn't. Um, so we fixed that so that it no longer updates those beginning balance values. So really when it comes to beginning balances, all the different changes and, and updates that we've made in inventory, um, those beginning values should no longer be affected. Um, so if they go in and do a capitalization criteria and, and reset their values, it shouldn't update beginning balances like it did in classic. It should make the changes on the adjustments column. 
Uh, same thing with stuff like this. You know, it shouldn't be affecting any of the beginning balance amount. We want to keep those intact so that the beginning balances stay the way they are um, at the beginning of the year and not get updated because of something they're doing in the current year. Um, so those changes that are made should be reflected in the other columns of the gap report and not in the beginning balance. That will help immensely when they're trying to close out for the year and making sure that their prior year ending balances match the current year's beginning balances. So I you think we've got them all so um, that those aren't updated anymore. All right, those are the bug fixes that we had. Um, improvements, um, we are continually making performance improvements. Um, and uh, especially when it comes to the audit report, we did make an improvement regarding the closing of the fiscal year and the audit report, but I know we still have some um, more performance improvements um, to be made to the audit report. So we're, we're making them as we go here, but uh, we did get um, some of that taken care of um, in April. Um, we implemented a date range filtering. Yay, I know a lot of people were asking about that. And so we put that out there in um, the actual, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's in all the uh, transaction uh, menus, but in here I can go in and just put in 7, 1, 22, dot, dot, 2, 8, 31, 22. And what it's going to do, it's going to go out there and just um, select those items within that date range. So this is working for dates. Um, so tag number, we don't have the ability to do that because these are nu numeric or alphanumeric. So they would have to still just kind of do that filtering um, by going in and just starting to enter uh, the tag number and it should filter down. But when it comes to the actual date columns, they should be able to use the dot dots to enter in a range. One other thing that we did was we implemented um, Google Duo uh, multi-factor authentication um, in inventory. And so um, there are new properties that need to be set in order to use that in inventory. And we have that Duo security integration guide out there. And there's a link um, on the recap notes about that for more information about it. Um, what they're doing on the system in order to enable it is they would be going down to users. And it's very similar to what you know, you're seeing with um, USAS and payroll as well. So if I just went in and just kind of viewed one of these, what we have now is this two-factor authentication. So that needs to be checkmarked. And once that's checked then, um, and they you know, initially get set up with Duo on if they're using a mobile device or whatever, um, you know, the first time it's gonna to have to ask them, you know, they first get logged into inventory, you know, to get it connected to Duo. Then after that, it should just automatically go to Duo, ask for them to authenticate it, and boom, they're in um, to the inventory application. Um, but that is what that's all about. So this needs to be checkmarked in order for that to work properly. Um, if they have Duo set up and they don't have this check, they're not going to be able to get into inventory. So they need to get that, um, make sure that that is checkmarked. And I believe too, for those of you that are hosting with the Management Council, I think we have a screenshot, I'm gonna go back to the release notes here, of a new VRA um, catalog item. I don't see uh, SSDT team, um, the support people do not see the same thing that you guys see in VRA, um, but um, we were told that they set up a new catalog item here that allow you to install the Duo multi-factor authentication um, for, for this. So um, that's out there in VRA. And I believe that's all we had with inventory. Um, before we sign off here, I just wanted to um, discuss what's coming up um, this month. Uh, again, another busy month. Um, um, we've got uh, trainings here. We've got the fiscal year end uh, release our checklists um, coming out, the review, trying to say the right word here. Uh, next um, next uh, week, um, so, oh, hold up here. Andrew's got a couple questions here. Absolutely. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, so the first thing is, um, 
Has there been any progress made on inventory having a regular fiscal archive? We've, we've been having some issues with the zip files. Um, I mean, we're, our tech team is working around it, but you know, zip files get blocked a lot of times in mail filters because it's a, you know, delivery mechanism from, for not fun things. Um, so we've been having districts not receiving the, the fiscal year end emails because they're, they've blocked out zip file, any zip file emails from coming into the districts. That's a good question, Andrew. And from what I have been told is we are trying to get the document store um, for the document management and archive. Okay, articles. yes, Anyways, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get that up and going. Um, and so that is supposed to be coming out um, in this quarter. And okay, so cool. with that, part of that, you know, and they're you know doing the USAS and payroll archive stuff, basically taking that information from file archives and storing it on this document store instead so that it's not in within our application. Um, you guys will still be able to see it. Just I'm just talking to USAS and payroll first here. Um, you guys will be able to see, still be able to go in and retrieve those reports in those applications, um, but it's gonna make things much faster because it's all stored in a separate database and not within the application. Now for inventory, what they're going to do. I don't know the specifics on how it's going to be retrieved in inventory, but what they're planning on doing is taking that report bundle and it automatically going to the document store. And they want to get that done before fiscal year end. So there's no more email involved. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. So, so that's what they're trying to do is get that um, taken care of. So we don't have to worry about the whole email, um, the large data that's, you know, on the email, you know, with the file and stuff. So being able to go in and having that now as to how to access it, you know, I haven't been um, given that information about exactly where they're going to be um, pulling it. I'm assuming somewhere in inventory, they're going to be able to, to look up those reports. Um, I don't know for sure. I don't know if they'll have a, a login into the document store to see those inventory reports but they will no longer be something that they have to store themselves on their um, laptops, you know, on their. Yeah. So that's, that's where we're at with that. Okay. And then my second question was, I know we have the duo available for the inventory now, but my, I guess my question was what multi-factor is a security feature. What is the impetus behind blocking the what what in the inventory system is there's no socials there's no tax id there's no addresses there's no right like what what are we like has the auditor said hey we want this mfa like or did we just say hey we want an mfa because we're just kind of having continuity of offering um you know i would assume it was something that the auditors had requested but I will have to find out about that for sure. I'd have to look at the JIRA issue to see. Um, it, just, it just, it doesn't seem to me, I mean, you know, I threaten me if I'm, I mean, it's just all, what in inventory is not public information is and, what would be my question. And the one thing too, that we are eventually going to have with inventory is the ability to go out and pull like, for like vendors to talk to USAS. And stuff like that. And I and I don't know if I'm just thinking off the top of my head some of that stuff. If you know eventually we're gonna have the ability for like EIN numbers or something like that or or social security numbers to get pulled in for some reason. Um I wouldn't think so in inventory, but I think they may be just be doing that too for future. Okay. Uh, you know, of what you know we may be able to, you know, offer later. I, I know we've got JIRA issues for. Um, to pull account information, vendor information, to to instead of them just entering an inventory and it not checking back to USAS, um, those type of things. So I don't know if something there, um, but yeah, I would assume they're, they're either they're making it consistent or the auditors have requested that. So okay, um, so it's one of it's one or the other or both. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so going back, uh, those were good questions, especially about the, the document store and 
crossing my fingers that all gets done before they start closing out inventory so that um, those will just be sent to document store instead. Okay, so like I said, we do have um, <clears throat> some um, upcoming, we have our fiscal year end review with you guys next um, Friday. So that is going to probably be um, a very, probably two to three hours, we're not really sure, um, just to go over all the fiscal year and steps with you guys, uh, the checklists and stuff that we have. So we have started some of that out there in our meeting and trainings page. If I'm out there and I go down to the 2023 fiscal year end. <clears throat> so right now this is in draft form. But it's got, you know, the date of when we're going to host it and then um, all of our different um, links, documentation, PowerPoints and stuff like that are going to be available um, underneath here. So this is where you're going to go out and get those general uh, fiscal year end checklists and supporting documentation um, for you to um, use for your own meetings with your districts. So that's where that's at. So we'll get that all ready to go before next week. Also in May, we've got um, an EMIS common errors and how to prepare for uh, end of year for EMIS submission. So this is going to be a, a very a good one for you guys um, to um, attend. Um, so we're gonna get into some details about that. Try to find the information and find those errors before fiscal year uh, starts um, so that those can be taken care of ahead of time and the collection goes flawlessly. So um, that's what that's about. And I believe that's um, the two besides this recap session today that we have in May. And then obviously in June, uh, we'll get started on some other uh, different uh, sessions that we have, SGRS Advance and Balancing Tips. We're gonna be doing that at the beginning of June. Uh, USAS Account Change Options. Um, we're gonna be doing that in June as well. So. Um, we're continually providing you these sessions. And another one that um, I was kind of thinking about squeezing in was maybe an inventory FAQ session at the end of June. I know we don't have anything slated for that last Friday in June. Um, so if you guys are like, yes, 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 please um, let me know. Um, but because um, we thought maybe we could just kind of talk about that a little bit then. Um, or, or whatever you guys feel like would be a good inventory session to hold for fiscal year and other than you know going through the checklist that we'll be covering next week. Um, so let us let me know and um, we'll get one scheduled for that last Friday in June. Uh, let's see. I think I think that's all I had to go over is just talk about those. Um, so if you guys don't have any further questions, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. And it's um, thanks you guys for taking the time to meet with us and you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.